Welcome to episode 75 of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we've got another member of the Great Britain senior men's team. It is none other than Teddy Okaria for GB starting guard. He actually uh, was was requested by Gabe Olashani last week. That's not to say that he wasn't on our to-get list before then, uh, but it kind of accelerated the process. We managed to make it happen this week. Now, Teddy uh, was actually at one of the first events I filmed in 2009. So I've kind of seen his entire career trajectory from that initial uh, Midnight Madness event as a fresh-faced uh, British prospect uh, before he went on to win a national championship with the Westminster Warriors in 2010 with a stacked under-18 squad and then went to the States uh, before going on to college. He signed actually initially with VCU after their final four appearance the year before um, and ended up transferring to Ryder where he did great things and obviously now is a pro and I think he's going into his fifth year. Uh, he's played in Estonia, Italy uh, and predominantly actually Greece. And I think, as you'll hear in this podcast, there is a chance we may see him back in the BBL. Well, not back, but back in the UK in the BBL uh, this season, which would be would which would just be huge uh, for the domestic game. So it's a super enjoyable conversation. Uh, great to talk about uh, his career and everything uh, he has experienced um, so far. But before we get into the show, please take two seconds to check out our Patreon account, p a t r e o n dot com forward slash h w o p s f i x, or there's a link in the description. Um, from there, you can sign up to give us a monthly or an annual contribution of as much or as little as you like to help support the work that we're doing. Uh, this this takes up a lot of our time. It does cost money and we are coming direct to you, our audience, to help us grow this thing, to help support us, to help us make it as big as possible and help grow uh, the British basketball media landscape. So please go and check it out, patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. As always, if you're watching on YouTube, let me know in the comments what you think about what Teddy had to say. Um, if you want to uh, reach out to me on any social media platform, it's at HoopsFix. Or you can hit me up on my email address, sam at HoopsFix.com. I reply to every single one. Uh, the only other thing to say, as always, there's a few visuals, uh, visual internet problems. Uh, audio is absolutely fine, but the actual video on YouTube uh, it gets a little bit pixelated at times. We did drop the call a few times. We had to restart it. Um, but it's generally fine. I think it's, it's good enough, um, but it's not ideal. So I just thought I'd give you a warning. Anyway. That's enough from me. Uh, here is this week's show with GB guard Teddy Okaria for. Teddy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So uh, I'm coming to you from from Plasto. You're coming to me from from Stratford. Um, yeah. Obviously, you're still in London. So you know this season's fast approaching. Kind of what's been going on for you this kind of off season, and how how are you how are you feeling, and what you, what are your thoughts going into this season? Kind of where you're going to end up? What's what's it looking like? Um, well, to start, there was COVID, there was lockdown, so it ended this season in Greece last year early. Um, came back, and for me right now, I'm just enjoying the time off. If I'm honest, <laughs> if I'm, if I'm brutally honest, I, I love the feeling of being home, being around family. Uh, it's like the first time I've got to be home in 10 years since leaving to go to America for college. So it's, it's something I'm embracing now. Uh, probably not going to get the time off again uh, once I get back into it and get back to playing. So this summer and this, this past preseason that you call it, uh, I've just been relaxing, chilling with family, working on my body. And um, that's it. I spoke to my agent a couple of times about jobs, but offers haven't been what I wanted them to be. So we're waiting for the patient, the right one. Uh, considered playing at home, talked about that stuff, give that a, a lot of thought. And then I'm just even looking at the seasons all over the countries in Europe and, and places, they're not even starting, you know, so it's, it's kind of a blessing even longer to stay home and, and wait, wait it out, see what the best situation will be and go from there. One of the conversations me and Bradley, who does a lot of writing and, and work with me, at, obviously at Hoops Fix, has been having all, all summer, uh, well, going into, going into this season, was the London Lions. And we were certain that at some point uh, you were going to end up signing with them. Just we're like, he's an East London boy, you know, they're down the road, like, it just makes sense. So I've got, I've got to ask yeah. you, like, has there been any conversation with the Lions? Um, what happened if there were conversations? Uh, would you like to play for them? Kind of, yeah, where's, where's it at? Uh... We did speak. I spoke to Vince, obviously, because we're close. We're East London, uh, and being home is is perfect. The situation would be would be great. Uh, the team's good. The team that they picked was was great. Uh, it would have been good to, to sign with them and play that Champions League game. I don't know if what, what would have changed or the, the from both sides. The the teams looked uh, 
Um, how do you call it? You know when when it's your first game, it's your first uh, rusty. official game, so they're a little sloppy, rusty, yeah. And then, uh, but moving forward, I don't know. We're gonna see what what happens with develops. Obviously, they've got a full team now. Um, it would be good to to practice with them, to talk with them more, and and get that stuff rolling. I don't. I, I'm not uh, closed-minded to anything. Um, every opportunity is an opportunity for me. So uh, if that happens in the future and it's the right situation, it'll be a blessing to play five minutes from my house. You know. Yeah, you, you know, you've spoken there about how, how much you're enjoying sort of being home and having having a time off, um, and having the considerations of potentially playing in the BBL. Like, kind of, how, how do you feel about you know taking that step? We've seen a lot of guys in the last few years uh, that normally probably would be playing in in Europe sort of make the step to come home, strengthen the BBL. Seen a lot of GB guys kind of in the league. Um, yeah, like sort of where, where do you see it fitting in with you? Like, how do you feel about it? Uh, do you think it's something that we could see this season? Um, well, to to start with, I think the BBO need, deserves more respect than it gets. I think uh, there's a big miseducation from a from a perspective where you just don't know enough about the people in it and where they've come from. Because I've said for for the past couple of years now that uh, these guys that play in the BBO could easily play in Europe, easily play in, in the first second division, and they come home because they want to be home, not because they can't play. You know that talented uh, Justin Robertson you've got all these guys Ogo whoever him goes on, the list goes on you know so I think from that perspective like the league is competitive the league is good um, it's somewhere that is it, only going to get better it is getting better uh, for me personally coming home I think would would be it makes sense to it makes sense to, to build uh, in a place that you started from uh, this season I think Again, it'll be up to to my agent, and and, the, and if the situation is correct, uh, I think it doesn't it doesn't take uh, much for the situation to be correct either, because uh, it's a desirable place when you're from that place, you know. So it makes it easier when you when you're from where you want to play, and if the and you get to see it when other countries when you play in in Greece or Italy, and their home players are sometimes the better players or they start and all this stuff. So it makes no difference from when you're playing at home or where you're playing because competition is going to be good. So uh, this year, I think uh, it's, it's a possibility. I know a lot of teams have signed their guys, and but the league hasn't started, so we still got time. I know there's Americans coming in and out, foreigners coming in and out, uh, but they're just waiting around. So we'll just see what happens when the league actually starts and what happens. Last year, there was a team that I spoke to late about trying to make the playoffs or that was in the playoffs. I don't know if I should give them <laughs> give the name away, but it was close and it's, it was like a it was pretty close to getting done. Where I think the team would have would have strive, uh, thrived if I if I got there and the playoffs would have been a, a reachable goal or whatever would have happened, you know. But coming home this year, I'm waiting for the season to actually have some sort of direction, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this season is very, is very much up in the air. From from what I can gather, speaking to various people, it seems like. At the moment, everything is based on whether or not the government's going to provide some type of financial support. Um, and I know a lot of teams are waiting on sort of filling out the rest of their rosters and, and announcing other signings and stuff and bringing guys in when they know what the situation uh, financially is going to be from the government side. Because, well, as we've heard multiple times, without fans, the league's not viable. Uh, and if that's the way that it's got to be for the next six months, which is what Boris Johnson seems to be saying, and the government seems to be saying, then uh, it's, it puts the league in a, in a very difficult situation without the help. So, yeah, but exciting times. Like it would be, it would be amazing to to have you back. You got to be able to tell us who who the team was last last year, because I mean, obviously it's done now. Like, it's not a big deal, surely. What was the team? Right? It was with, it, I think it was Cheshire. It was Cheshire. I was talking with about okay. making maybe around Cheshire. With, with, that's where Ben Mopfer plays. A shout out to Ben. That's yeah. my guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, me and him would. Have some damage over there but yeah that was a, that was a, that would have been a good situation had it had it gone through so wow wouldn't it shot me we'll see what happens <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting times for the league man i do feel like it's kind of that's that's what makes this this whole covid thing even more devastating because it does feel like the league is just starting to get to that point where of course you know there's still a lot of work to be done like everyone that's around it is the first to admit that but you know with all this sort of the talent that's coming home um and, and playing in the league, I, I do feel more people are talking about it than, than has been in, in previous years past. Uh, 
and there is just generally more interest. And there's rumored there's rumored TV deal on the table potentially that's c- coming, like a multi year deal, which again would potentially catapult things, you know, to, to new heights. So, yeah, it's exciting times. Do you, do you feel like I know, of course, you, you know, you you've been you've been abroad for what ten years or so, um, but I know you're back a lot. And when you are back, especially in the summers, you're very much in the scene. You know, you're you're at the runs, you're turning up at events, you're kind of on the ground, so to speak. Uh, from what you've seen, like, do you feel things are, have, have sort of been pushing forward, or, or kind of do you feel, feel they're stale? Like, kind of, yeah. What are your thoughts on it? I think they're definitely being pushed forward. I think uh, some teams are taking the, the lead in in pushing it more on the social media front, where they've got better campaigns, so they're more like uh, seen and recognised. But when it when it comes to summertime, I'm always with the with the same guys that are playing in the in the the league, and it gets better every year. And that's the people that I personally like you know, train against, measure myself against in the summertime when you have runs, when you have hoof classics and stuff like that. That's who's playing. It's the best player from the league and everybody else, whatever, you know. So it's definitely got better. It's definitely improving. And the overall popularity of the sport around London or that I know, I can only speak for London, is, is getting bigger and everybody's talking about the finals or this. And it, it corresponds now to, to the league here and wanting to see more basketball here. So, yeah, it's definitely getting better, I think. Hopefully we can we can have that uh, that breakthrough that 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 uh, everyone is 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 waiting for. So just just before we kind of go way back into the archives and talk about the early days and, and sort of your your start in basketball, just quickly on, on the on the sort of lockdown stuff. Kind of this summer, you know, you, you mentioned it, but you're spending time with family, seeing family. Like, have you had a chance to work out a lot? Like, how has it been with sort of access to gym or, or working out and finding somewhere to play? Like, kind of what's your situation? When did you actually get back to London? Uh, how long have you been here? And kind of what's your summer basketball-wise been, been like? I got back in, like, uh, May, May, June. Summer was a... Uh... I think it was, a, I don't remember a lot, but it was a struggle. Getting into the gym still is a struggle. That's the biggest problem we have in England and for uh, basketball players as as uh, athletes, period. Uh, that's what I think is the, one of the biggest uh, setbacks for us because we can't get into the gym anytime. With other sports, you can do whatever. And then other sports are even prioritised above us when the participation numbers that I've seen personally are through the roof when it comes to basketball. So that's a struggle. But uh, in terms of, uh, for me personally, I've just been working on mobility stuff like getting uh, strength right and just making my body relax first or like decompress the last 10 years before I, it starts to build up again because it's like i said it's the only opportunity i've ever got where i could spend this much time off knowing that everybody's got time off kind of thing without losing the edge of playing and working out but when i've got uh, access to the gym i'm in the gym i'm working out but just off the camera you know <laughs> Do you, do you have what's your what's your do you have a gym that you've got regular access to like around Stratford at all or are you is it really like that much of a struggle? To, for basketball or lifting? For basketball. Uh, in Stratford, no. In, in Stratford, uh, no, no. Uh, I've worked out a couple of times uh, with Brian Naguru. He's a, he's a good guy coming up definitely uh, with Cola and access to their schools. But that's the that's the biggest um, facility we can get. The school the schools that are open and. Uh, some gyms, you uh, yell sometimes um, just through my through my mom and NASA, but otherwise no, nah, no gym access. And even some schools are just saying no. But then you got the COVID and the lockdown, so maybe that's all come into one. I don't want to just blame the gyms and they say that they'll hate us, but you know what, what goes on and how hard it is to get into a gym. For sure, like I always say to people, especially like sometimes you know um, Americans or, or Europeans will ask me about kind of what the barriers are and stuff, and I say you would not believe. Every summer, I will get GB guys hitting me up being like, I need somewhere to work out. Can you get access to a gym? Do you know somewhere where I can play? And it's the same for everyone. It's, it's just like, you know, we're talking about guys that are representing their country at the highest level, going to European championships or whatever. They come back in the summer and they can't even find somewhere to play. Like, it's just, it's mad to me. Like, mad. Um, yeah. So... So okay, so so let's rewind. Like I said, like I said to you uh, just just before we start recording, I've been deep into the archives, going back, uh, trying to sort of going back over my memories of when I first. So you two, funnily enough, two thousand nine, which was the first summer I started recording, uh, you were playing in Midnight Madness, Leighton. Um, yeah. So that was the first oh. time. That was the first time I saw you, young baby face killer. And I was like, who's this kid? Yeah. I remember someone being like, yeah, Teddy, man. Like, he's a player. He's a player. Um, and then, of course, yeah, fr- from there, like, the next year, 
So that season, 2009-2010, was the, the year of Westminster when you had the stacked squad, which, funnily enough, I did a podcast with Gabe last week, and he was talking about originally, he came to a couple of practices, was thinking about joining that team, but wanted to kind of do his own thing because he felt like they were too stacked and they were going to win everything, which obviously you did. Um, but let, let's go kind of even, even uh, sort of early in that. Like, your first exposure to the game, I think it was, it was through your stepdad. Um, yeah. But can you kind of talk about that, that sort of how you first picked up a ball and why you first started playing? So I think I was probably maybe 10 or 11. I was in, in year six or year five, year six. Uh, my mum met my stepdad. Um, he played basketball, coached. And obviously I have an older brother, Anthony, shout out Anthony. Uh, he, he started playing. So, you know, younger brothers just do what older brothers does. So I just copied what he was doing. And when I was, he's two years older than me, I would go practice with him uh, at East London Royals. Um, so I practiced there, uh, didn't play a lot, obviously, just ran around like a little kid on the court, uh, stuff like that. Um, then got into it when I became like uh, 12, 13 and moved to year seven and realized that I had been playing with all the players already. So it was not easier, but I was like a, a step ahead kind of, you know. So I started taking it really seriously when I recognized that, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't be good at this. And then I think the record, the per, it was it was perfect timing because that's when you came out. That's when uh, Midnight Madness started. That's when all these things started to evolve. And I was just just like the year before, almost coming into these things, and it, with my own kind of way of playing and my own group of age group kind of thing. So that's where it started, and then from there it just took off. At what point do you think the 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 switch flipped from you know you're you're loving it and it and it's fun, but now this is like a serious thing and this is what you're spending all your time doing? Uh, I think it might have been again around 13, 14. I remember, the, I remember Steve Bucknell had a camp at Crystal Palace that led into like the Den camp, the first one I went to. And it was around there when I first got to get outside the East London shell, the London shell and see other players from other, other, kind, other places in the country. And then measure myself against them, and it was like, okay, I can, I can be good. There's nothing stopping me from being uh, one of these, I don't know, better players or whatever, you know. And when you're in London and East London, you form such a bond with the older players, kind of thing, where they promote you more, and they're like, oh, this, this is little Teddy, go, he, oh, he's nice, he's nice, whatever. So you just buy into that hype, and then you believe in yourself more, and then you work more and stuff. So then I started going to, um, I played one season under 13s with East London Royals. And then the next year, I played under 15s with Hackney White Heat, with Helio, with Ryan Martin, with uh, David Oladouj, with Iliandro. Didn't play a minute. I, I sat on the bench. Me and my me and my guy, we sat on the bench. Uh, but the whole year, we was it was rough. We was, I was traveling from from Stratford well, after school. I'd come back home, get on the train, go Turnpike Lane, get on the bus, go practice with these lot. And they were, it was just it was like the coach was Ben Smart. Sometimes Richard Ferguson would come in coach and so it was tough you know it wasn't like soft they were it was it was in there beating each other up talking trash junk everything so then when we came back in it the next year under 15s it was like i was playing my own age group coming from a year where i didn't play and played about a year above it was like okay i can really play now because that age group wasn't really seeing me much and that's just how it, how it went from there and then it went into the uh england trial under under 15 under 16 and getting cut and being, I don't know, big pissed about that. Who, who, cut, who cut you? <laughs> who cut me? You want the name, though? I think it was, <laughs> uh, I think it was uh, Simon Fisher. Ah, oh, Simon Fisher, okay. <laughs> I didn't want to name drop, but you asked, didn't it? So, uh, but it, it, I, made, I think I made it to look like the last 14, and then the last, it was the last cut, so it was the last 12. And then they went off, and then it was like, oh, man, I was like, man, screw this, whatever. You have that young mindset, you know, where it's like, oh, whatever, blah, blah. And then the next, I think it was under 18s. Was it under 18s? Yeah, under 18s came back. But it was a different mindset, a different approach of like, yo, there's no way you're even considering cutting me. And the trial was, the trial went exactly like that for me. It came, I came in there with the mindset of I'm not even playing around and you're not even going to think about cutting me because these guys aren't better. We're just going to go at it like that. And that's how it, how it happened. And that's how we played. So that's what happened. I'm, I'm trying to... You're, you're 1992 born, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who were the other 92s, kind of the top players of your generation? Because the thing is, I, I can think of 91s. A bunch of top 91s come to mind. A bunch of 93s come to mind. But then when I think yeah. of 92s, it's like, 
who was there? Connor Washington was was ninety two as well, right? Uh, I think. Yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I don't know where he, where he was back then. I don't remember him back then. Obviously now he's a, he's he's around. He's great. Yeah. Shout out to Connor. Uh, 92 back then. I think it was me. Maybe Re- it was. Re- I remember Rima Lascelles and Devon was the point guard. Us three were the point guards then. Um, I don't really remember other. I remember Calvin from Sheffield. I think maybe he was 92 or 93. Lefty. Calvin. Remember him? I can't think who that is. You know. He was. He was nice. He was nice. Um, who else? 92s. I don't. I don't actually know a lot of 92s. I'm. I'm born November, so I'm born right at the end. Like right. if I would. Two more months, I would have been 93. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know where I fall, but so in the so you so you went so you were playing with, with Hackney and mm-hmm. then did you play with NASA at some point as well? Because the club was the club set up around that point, yeah. That was a that was like a, a local league thing. My mum set up a club, uh, she she ran the under 13, 14, but I never played for like the junior program, I was already too old. And then under six, I think I played like a local league, uh. On a Sunday, I think it was. It was like every Sunday, and it was like in Britannia or something in Hackney. Um, I remember playing against Ovi one year. Ovi, Ovi played. I don't know if you know. Ovi, Ovi played that one for Barney Bulldogs. We would play, and we were just. Uh, it was just like I don't know. It was more fun that league, but uh, playing with my brother, obviously playing for my mum, it was like a dope uh, experience, you know, opportunity, yeah, yeah. and it's something you you get to look back and reflect on. What was Ovi like? Because because I tell you. When when Ovi come back that summer of 2010 after he'd been in the states, and I remember everyone saying, like before he went to the states, like he wasn't good, like he he wasn't known as a player, like there was no like real recognition of him as being like this real talent. And then he come back and everyone was like, I cannot believe how much he's improved. Like, what are your, what are your memories of him in that Britannia uh, local league? Uh... I'll go back a little bit. So my, my stepdad used to coach at Barney Bulldogs when he first started coaching before he moved over to like come and coach with uh, the Royals. And I'm realizing now it's more like, a, I don't know, internship or what you would call it nowadays, you know? So I knew him from, from way back and another guy named, uh, who, who's my guy who I met in Den Camp. But Obi was more chill, more reserved, and he didn't get so much attention, but he used it kind of to fuel him. He's like a very... He'll keep it in his head more like, a, okay, I remember. I remember in four years when I got to play you. He's like that. He's not like a, okay, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to cry about it kind of thing. We're just going to, we'll see when I'm, I'll just disappear, go work and then come back and we'll play. And that's it. So that's how he is. But off the court, he's like normal. He's chilled, plays video games 24-7 and he's like regular, regular guy, you know? Yeah, yeah. So what made you decide to then go to Westminster? Because again, that's you know living in Stratford, it's not the closest, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened was LeBron came over and and did this more than a game documentary, and he got got invited to like a premiere. So at the premiere, it was like me, Ryan Martin, Arnold. If you remember Arnold, Matt, uh, Illy, who else? Mustafa, Mustafa, uh, Leon Bennett Harris, um, Kieran from from Hackney White Heat. David Oladuj, all these players, and I was sitting around watching, and we all played for different clubs, and it was like a Warriors thing, so you can blame me if you want. And I just looked at Jackson and Norman, and I was like, yo, why do we keep taking this, these different London teams and going up? Because I remember going up to Final Fours and losing to, like, Manchester Magic, losing to, like, Sheffield Sharks, losing. I was like, yo, we've got the best kind of players in London. Let's just bring them on one team and then see what happens. So I sold the idea to Ryan, sold the idea to a couple other people, and they were like, yeah, let's do it kind of thing. And then we did it. And it was it was a great year. I just wish we recorded it. Wish we had a documentary or something on that year. That would have been amazing. Do you, do you know what that that season like? I was I was so new on the scene, but I had conversations with Jackson. I think and Namo about potentially uh, doing a documentary like and following all season because they were kind of like, look, you know, this is this team's gonna be stacked. Like obviously after yeah. the, the hype of Midnight, like Midnight Madness was crazy that summer. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, I would love to try and make it happen, but there was just too much other stuff, stuff going on. Yeah, and never ended up doing it. But um, I do have what I should actually do. You know, during uh, during at the start of lockdown, I ended up going through. I got all these like I got so many hard drives. Some of the footage I'm yeah. sure I've lost, but I've still got hard drives and stuff. And I, I know that I do have. I'm pretty sure I've got the final. Uh, yeah. That year, which I should put up as raw highlights or whatever, because you had a pretty big game in the final. You didn't get MVP, did you? But I'm pretty sure you you had a pretty mm. solid game now. Yeah, yeah. For, uh, and Biscuit was on that team. I know you know the you know Biscuit from 
Stratford too. He was in that team. Yeah, that yeah. Team was, bro, stacked. But yeah, the finals was was good. It was uh, I think it was us and Reading. Reading beat us the only game of the season in the cup. Uh, Don't know how they. Right. Yeah, yeah. They it, but they so, but they had Adam Thosby and mm. Kofi Josephs right with their two main guys who obviously gone on to professional yeah. careers themselves. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah, but a, a, a secret story that me and me and Jackson know is that when we was like for me to get to America we was emailing schools, emailing schools like, like regular stuff, you know, like hey, we got a kid, he wants to go to the school, we have highlight tape, highlight tape, highlight tape. They were asking for, and Adam Thosby had upla- uploaded the the full game of the final onto YouTube. I think, if I'm correct, and then the coach would watch the YouTube clip and see that, you know, and then that's how I ended up getting the the, the look to go to America. So it wasn't even a direct thing through me. It was like he had uploaded it. Jackson and I were doing emails, and then he managed to link it to this and this. So it was pretty. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you do you uh, still talk to a lot of those uh, Westminster teammates from that season? Yeah, I talk to I talk to pretty much everybody still. Yeah. Uh, if it's, it's through uh, social media or if I'm close to them in person. Ryan, I'm close to Ovi, I'm close to Biscuit, I'm close to uh, everybody else is a little further, but we talk all the time on social media. So. Yeah, I was a, yeah it, was a, it, was a, it was a great se- great season, great team. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, great memories. Like, I, I hold that season so close to my heart because it was the first one really that I was really in it. Uh, and yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, just just those memories. I can't believe it was so long ago now. Like the time is just the time has just flown. And then to see all you guys, who obviously yeah. I, I remember as as teenagers, you know, with all these dreams, yeah. and now kind of representing the Great Britain senior team, and and you know, doing your thing professionally. Like it, it's kind of yes, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, so the the move to the states, like kind of you knew, even before that season, like you knew. I feel like from quite a young age that you that's what you wanted to do. You wanted to go to the USA. Um, yeah. Obviously, that move come about. You ended up going to Virginia, right? Was, was it Christchurch, the name of your school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. High school, yeah. How, how did you find that sort of transition from, from the UK to, to the US? Uh, for me, honestly, the transition was kind of easy. Like, growing up from in London, you have this mindset of, like, you just got to make it with whatever you can make it with. And then when I got there, I realized these guys are, like, there's a hype to go over there as as and it, it puts this cloud in your head that they're miles ahead, which sometimes they are in terms of facilities or resources or access to gyms. But when it comes to just being a human being, we're human beings. So when we, when I went over there, I was like, okay, I'm here now, and I know you're gonna judge me and everybody behind me based on how I play. So I can't let any softness, any whatever, come out. So we just have to go. And so when I got there, it was just the first day I got there, we. I didn't do anything. And the second day I got there, I was like, okay, let's go scrimmage, let's go play. And we just went. And, and it was like, I'm, I'm here to, to, to do something, not just to, you know, to be there and, and get sent back or do, or just be like a, another number or whatever. But early on, I didn't even, I didn't, I only really wanted to go to America because of the hype everybody had around America. I didn't know what in America, what was in store for me because I grew up with me, my brother, my mum, my grandma, who haven't really gone to America to travel. So I don't know what, is over there to begin with, you know. And realizing now, me and uh, realizing now, I don't know. There's different opportunities now. There's different avenues to go through, you know. There's junior programs in Europe and stuff like that, which are, which have benefits and and or plus and minuses on on both sides. But the America transition was for me kind of easy. It was just fitting in and doing what you do uh, like every day here. Did did it. Did your lifestyle change a lot in terms of suddenly having access to a gym all the time, being able to work out a lot more and stuff like that? Yeah, that did, that did. When I got there, the coach let me like wake up early and just go to the gym because I was, we stayed on campus. So I had a dorm and the dorm was like across the street from the gym. He'd, he'd, he'd either leave, he'd either give, me, give me the keys or leave the fire exit door like open at night so I could just come in there at seven in the morning and shoot before we had to do like breakfast and and roll call and all these weird things they do over there in their, pre- in their prep school and stuff. So that that was cool. And then after school, you can you live at school, so you live at the gym. You know, it's like you can just go there whenever you want. You can get two people, you, oh, five people, play three on three, play five on five, whatever you want. So that access was was life changing, pretty much. How was it culturally? Uh, culturally, they're similar. They're, they're, apart from the access to food they eat, uh, they're, they're similar in in terms of. Uh, what what they like, you know, the music, the the way they play the game. Um, I think in London we play very more athletic. We we use athleticism a lot too, so we run up and down and we and, and 
jump high or whatever, even though I'm not that, that kind of player. I just fit in more mentally and that if you give me them tools, I could use them pretty well. So uh, culturally, it was, it was pretty cool. And it's a, it's, it was a learning experience to learn a different coach because I went from Virginia to uh, New Jersey, which was th two different mini coaches within the same uh, uh, macrocosm, whatever you want to call it, in the States. Did you, had you had any interest from um, US colleges before you went for your year in uh, your prep, your prep high school year. While I was still here. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. no I didn't. I didn't know anything about it. This was just me, Jackson. As I had a com conversation with Lloyd a couple times about even potentially looking into uh, going to Europe early before going to America and what the benefits and all this stuff. Just conversations like every kid should have because you should uh, have as much information as you can so you can make the best decision. You know. Uh, but in terms of offers or interests, even, no, nothing. I went to Christchurch, um, but I did go to an AAU tournament, uh, not a tournament, I went to a tryout with Bill Williams, who is like one of the big AAU teams over there. And um, after after that tryout, I was I had some interest in colleges. Just to, just to jump jump back quickly cause there, because you mentioned Lloyd. Did you, did, did you do a year, two years, or two years at Barking Abbey as well? Yeah. I did one year at Barking Abbey, so. Right, yeah, because that's the other, that's the other um, early footage I have was the when Barking Abbey hosted the EuroLeague Junior Tournament. Yeah. Uh, which, obviously, Barking Abbey had, like, a couple pretty impressive games. And I remember you having some pretty decent <laughs> decent outings as well. Was, that, was a good, that was a good thing. I think, like, Kim Key's junior team was there. I think maybe, like, a Spanish team. It was, it was a good Ma team. Maccabi yeah. was there. Um, yeah, yeah. Like some like one of the italian uh one of the italian powerhouses were there like it was, it was the teams were stacked like that was that was the euro league junior tournament um third, I, I think we might have came third if i remember yeah like you i know you did way better than everyone expected <laughs> yeah it was good no we did good but yeah after that it was like what what, what are you gonna do and it was like come back to for another year go to states but this is even without having offers from the states the the christchurch thing happened on a whim and it happened like within a month time. It was like, okay, we applied to because what happened? Midnight Madness. We went to schools out there. Remember the winners get to go to America and stuff. So we went to like five, six different schools, and the money they were asking to pay it was like a partial scholarship thing. But I just couldn't afford. My mom doesn't have that kind of money, or didn't have that kind of money, so we couldn't go yeah. there. You know, like, but the schools and the facilities we saw were amazing. Came home trying to figure out what I was going to do the next year, but obviously school was going to start soon. I think this was like August times, July times. And that's when the whole video with Adam, Adam Dosby and Jackson doing all the emails and helping me get to, to Christchurch. So, yeah, on, on the court, your year at, uh, at Christchurch was, was pretty successful. Uh, you ended up being the conference. It was conference player of the year, right, I think? Yeah, prep league player, I think. Prep, prep, league, prep league player of the year. year um, had pretty, pretty good numbers. Uh, and you're being recruited by some pretty decent schools as well. Kind of, like, what's your memory of the recruiting process? Who was the first... Uh, school to kind of show an interest um, and kind of yeah like how were you approaching the whole the whole situation for me it was it was brand new I don't I didn't have really no information on what happened for recruiting players uh, as a process at all so I just I just uh, played obviously played the games went to um, AU tryouts and then teams or my coach would have coaches come to to the uh, school when we worked out so when we did like five or five or three and three he'd have the local colleges come and like vcus uh elon came uh davidson came um georgetown came who else i don't know some some decent schools and vcu was the first school to offer me a full uh like actually offer me a a, a scholarship which i didn't even know was the difference between somebody offering you and so showing interest you know you're just out there kind of thing which was which was dope and then i think i, I don't know if i could, that was the year they went on the final four run too yeah you know and then but yeah so that's that was the recruiting process i was just sitting there. i did i took a visit to vcu an official visit i took an unofficial visit to uva um their school were, their facilities were, were crazy uh but vcu was was i don't know it was a it was a it was a great experience for me there after the final four run and the official visit I had, I was like, I'm coming there. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter what happened, I'm coming there. What, what was it in particular that sold you on VCU? Uh, it, was the, it was the energy, the guys they had and the, the way they played. Like the, the, the defense they played, 
it wasn't so much the, the defense, it was just the intensity they played it with. And they played uh, with intensity 24-7. Like, for the, the workouts when we had practice from the start was full court man-to-man from the first time the ball we checked up to the end of practice. It was never like half, to, half court, which you got tired, but you ended up being, being way better and stuff, you know? Did you feel like when you started at college, did you feel like it was a big step up from uh, the high school level? Yeah, 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 definitely. It's almost like a, almost like a, well, it is pretty much a professional league without the players getting paid, uh, you know. So, uh, and then you have so many more fans. I think our, our stadium had like seven thousand fans coming to the game. So, I don't know. You're seventeen, eighteen years old. You don't really expect that. Uh, and then you're coming from a different country. You don't even know anything about that uh, in comparison to here when you're playing in the junior level under thirteens, unless you go to a final four or something, you know. So. That was a huge step, uh, something that was a shock at, at the start. Probably it had to do with some some reason why I transferred too, because it was like a, a lot to take in, especially their style of play, um, playing time, opportunity, thinking long-term past uh, graduating and stuff. So it was a shock, but still made it somehow. One, one, of, the, um, one of the things I read actually was that uh, you were being recruited by um, a couple of big ACC schools as well, and but then it was like you originally were meant to do. Were you originally meant to do another year at high school, but you ended up leaving a year early or not doing the? I guess the prep. What would have been a prep year because of like I don't, yeah. What exactly happened there? Eligibility the rules here. They say when you graduate here at sixteen, that's your graduation date. Versus America is compulsory to finish your what would be your your junior or senior year, which would be sixth form over there which makes you graduate 18 so the only way to move there is to do a year of or two years of a levels or whatever they have now you know so i did the first year which moved my graduation date to uh 17 years old and then what would have been the prep year if i took it ended up being my 18 year old year okay so I, so when i when i did that and i played that season they were projecting me to to come back for another prep school year and then go to college and then um that's that's where the georgetowns and the um, wait, uh, not wait for us. Clemson, Clemson. yeah. Uh, Virginia Coach, as well. Who was at a game? Coach K was at a game uh, with Mike. He was recruiting Mike Benajay. He had already offered Mike Benajay. Okay, I think it was against Richmond, and we played. And I had like twenty, and he was like, "Okay, who's this kid? I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna have my assistant follow him." And then what happened? The summer finished, and it was like, I, I did the NCAA clearinghouse stuff, and they were like, "Yo, you have to leave right now." And it was like, well, what's going to happen? So I called Shark Smart and I was like, yo, I have to leave now. And he was like, we'll offer you now too. Come. And I was like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> and wow. that's, that's how that happened. Okay. So you would, so if the NCAA hadn't said that, essentially you would have done one more year in high school? Yeah, I would have done, no, I would probably done another year. I would have for sure done another year because I wanted to play AU and get that whole experience, but I didn't get to do that stuff too. Wow. So, so, so yeah, so your first, you did obviously two years at VCU before, before ultimately transferring, like, you know, Minutes were hard to come by. Like when you yeah, look yeah. back on that experience now, obviously as a sort of older, more mature, or whatever. When you look back on it, do you think that uh, you were good enough to play and you just weren't being given the opportunities, or did you feel um, like actually, you know, maybe it was a bit too much uh, the bright lights and it was the, sort of a bit too much of a step up for you at that point? Uh, I don't think it was it was bright lights and I wasn't good enough. I think maybe. Looking back on it right now, I, w- I didn't earn it enough. I didn't put enough work in, I'll be honest to say that. Uh, I know the guys around me were in the gym. Uh, we're talking about Troy Daniels, one of the best shooters in, in the league, you know. Um, Travion Graham in the in the NBA. Briante Weber, been in and out of the NBA, been EuroLeague, everything. So, you know, uh, these guys is in the gym all the time. I'm a kid coming from England, Stratford, with no idea what it's like to be in a different country. I ain't got my parents with me. I ain't got my big brother with me. I'm over there having fun, playing basketball. Everything is like whatever, you know. So uh, from that perspective, that's what made me not ready as much. Not as, as much as, oh, it's, it's too big of a stage. Because we went to, we transferred, we played uh, Kansas, we played uh, Michigan State. And there was no, uh, and the level wasn't something that I was like scared of or couldn't couldn't match you know mm. just in terms of work and, and work ethic i didn't have that back then at that time and that's what stopped me from getting those minutes which ultimately made me transfer what do you think uh ended up changing your work ethic and kind of gave you the kick up the butt that you needed to make you realize okay like if i'm gonna make this my career and this is what i want to do like i need to change what i'm doing 
just the, just the realization that you're not playing, and you're going to a game where there's seven thousand people, and you're not playing. You're sitting down. <laughs> that that realization after a while is like, okay, you can't do this much longer. Something needs to change, and you can't keep doing the same thing and expecting it to. So get in the gym, and that that's what it that's what happened. So with the switch, it, it was first coming to Ryder, which was considered maybe a lower school in terms of conferences. It was it was like a um, upholding the standards of VCU first. That I can't come from here. I need to play like this all the time. Which the, even those kids at uh, those schools. Were, were in the gym working as hard because they wanted to be at these schools and had the opportunity sometimes to transfer or get recruited up to go to and leave and go to these schools. So it's coming there, playing, working and, and just being in the gym, knowing that, OK, this is the opportunity now to be like a, a bigger fish in a smaller pond kind of thing. So take, make, make the most of it kind of. Do you remember the conversation that you had with the coaching staff of VCU to tell them that you wanted to transfer? Um, I think it was after the tournament. We got smoked by Michigan, and it was like a this is this just isn't working kind of thing. They they, I think I don't I think it was like a mutual thing. Really, like they knew kind of like okay this kid, if he doesn't change this, it's not going to work this way. So the best way to do it is like oh he wants to go okay we'll let him do his thing kind of thing. That's it was like a smooth transition, but it's, it's like perfectly fine. The relationship is great. I still go there in the summertime and I still go in the gym and I still use the facilities, still get a couple of t-shirts and stuff. I'm still like, <laughs> I'm still in there, you know, it's still like a family unit. It's just a, what was best for both parties kind of thing. Was there any part of you that um, sort of sort thought twice about transferring because you had to sit out a year? Um, yeah, that, that, put, that year really like, sucked if I'm honest because the people we had on that team that year we could have won the conference and it was me and another guy who sat out Matt Lopez who was like a seven footer and it was like if we had the full team that year for sure I think we would have won the conference but the year that I sat out I just used it as a, as a year for growth and, and working because at VCU it was like a not a tendency but guys always redshirted or sat out and then you can see how much they worked because they did our practice and then they would practice when we wasn't practicing or they would do extra stuff because they wasn't playing on game days they would work out like a real intense workout as if it was preseason for the whole year, you know? So that's how I approached that year uh, of sitting out, and which was good. And it, it gave me the, it was the first time like I got to come home for Christmas or got to come home for, I don't know, a random summer for a little bit longer and stuff because I didn't have to do extra stuff because I wasn't playing around. Was there any part of you that ever second guessed the whole basketball thing? Or, or was it very much like, you know, that this is what you want to do still, you just got to change some of the things about what you're doing? Um, second guess. I never really second guessed it because it was the only thing I was doing. It was like it was throwing in the fire, kind of like you play basketball now, and that's what I do. So uh, that, that's what kind of like I stuck to. I didn't really expand into going into different avenues and stuff. I did a business a business management in in uni and graduated, got a degree, everything. But that was more on a basis of just knowing that the world revolves around business and, and being able to have communication with all types of people. So that's why I did that avenue. But as a kid, I used to want to, I used to say I want to be a lawyer or, I don't know, random random stuff, you know? Yeah, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, um, so then when you finally did get on the court, like, I, th I think over the, you know, over, the f over your first two years of VCU, I think, you know, you averaged probably less than eight, eight minutes a game. Uh, and then straight away, well, after your year, your year of redshirt, and you want transfer, sitting out, whatever you want to call it, um, when you when you did get on the court, all of a sudden, you know, your minutes shot up to thirty ish a game, and you're sort of one of the main main players on the team. How did you find that as a transition? Like, was it easy for you to kind of go from having not been utilised and very much being stuck on the bench uh, to then suddenly? you know, having some responsibility and having expectations out of you. Did you find that difficult or was it, did you find it relatively easy? Uh, it wasn't easy, but it was just like a, this is what you've been waiting for kind of thing. It was like a, this is the moment you've, you, it all builds up to now. Now you've, now you've taken a year off. Now you've adjusted your mindset. Now you know what you need to do to play. Here's the minutes. Here's the keys the coach gave me. And he said, okay, now play and we'll run these offenses and show me everything show me that you're worth what I, I did to get you here and wait the year and everything you know and then it's like for me personal uh, goal of okay prove to everybody back home to yourself to who, whoever that you can play and then again the freedom of like it's just it's basketball 
Like you play the sport, you play the sport, go and have fun and do what you do. That that's it. If you if you sometimes when you overcomplicate it, you get in your own head. And I've done that even th- that year during certain games where I'm like, oh, and my coach would say like, oh, come on, man, come on, you're better than this, you're better than this, and you just the expectation sometimes gets to you, and you just learn. And the next year you hope to develop a little bit, but the transition was just like a more of an excitement of finally, finally, I get to play it and I get to do what I want kind of a little bit, you know. Did you find your confidence quickly rising, you know, as as time passed, the more games you got under your belt kind of in that role and feeling like, you know, you're looking at your numbers and you're saying, oh, actually, you know, I can do this. Uh, did you feel like your confidence was rising with it and kind of you got better progressively as a result of that? Yeah, I, I think the confidence first comes from the work that you put in, though. I think... Uh, that was the first year, like I was actually in the gym at night past nine o'clock because we again we lived on campus, so you can just go to the gym and our coach made sure it was always open. So when I started working more and practices, uh, so for the red shirt year, I'd be on what would be the practice team and I'd be like, can you the, the, I'd be I'd play the role of the the offensive threat on the other team. So all I got to do was shoot and and drive and do whatever I wanted to do. So that built confidence uh, going into the year I was playing. Yeah. You know, and then, uh, yeah, that's it. Your first call up to the uh, GB Senior Men's Program that happened whilst you were at Ryder, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it happened the, the the year before my senior year, I think. Yeah, yeah, twenty fifteen, I think. When you when you got, do you remember when you got that call and kind of and what it meant to you? To I'm assuming that that was something that you'd aspired to for for a long time, and then to finally get that call that you know we want you to to play for for, for the Great Britain Seniors. Um, kind of how did it, how did it make you feel? Uh, I don't I don't remember the actual call, um, but I know I know the feeling was like a whoa, this is like the real deal now kind of thing, in terms of national teams because under 16s, 18s is it's still kind of just considered junior level, you know, even though there's under 20 that might play up with, with the men sometimes that come into camp. When you play or when you're trying out with the men, I'm, I'm coming in and there's guy, I don't know, seven, eight years older than me, and, there's, and they're setting screens and hitting you, and you're like, whoa, I don't do this in college, you know? So that feeling was like, a, it, was, it was humbling, first of all, to get the call and be like, oh, wow, I'm in, in this group. Uh, and then it was like an excitement of, okay, I'm in this group, uh, what are you going to do about it, who's, who's here? Who could you go up against? And because I so a lot of these guys I don't get to play against throughout the whole year, only in the summertime. So in an organized setting with GB and stuff. And it was, that year we came in with a whole bunch of new people. I think it was me, Rob Gill, Chris. I think Gabe was there. I don't know. Um, it was like five or six people. Drew Sullivan had his like hundredth cap that year against New Zealand. It was kind of when uh, the program was in a sort of transition. Yeah, yeah. There was a summer where there was no games and stuff, so we just we just did some. Uh, trials with some new players I guess I was kind of included in that and that uh, Will Saunders I remember shout out Will um, yeah okay and then you're I'm right in thinking that you were able to get your masters at Ryder because of the fact that you did that extra year of sitting out right I, you know, did you I get did, your masters I, here's the question <laughs> you know I did I did the classes and then I had the capstone which is the final class before you get your masters and that was like that finished the last semester before going pro. So it was like, oh, I can't, I couldn't get it and I couldn't do the capstone. I was meant to do the capstone online, but it's just, I don't know, make bad decisions when you're younger. And I was like, man, whatever. I'm, I need to email them and see if I could do a class or something and just you know, maybe do an honorary one or something, you know, figure it out. But yeah, man, I didn't sure, get it. But surely there must be a way of, yeah, there must be a way of going back and just finishing the credits remaining or whatever, the, or getting the credits that you needed to, to complete it, surely, you would think. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, I guess just to kind of finish up on on the on the college stuff. When you look back on on your on your time in the in the college system, uh, what are the sort of the standout memories for you? Your favourite memories, favourite games, uh, big moments uh, that you look back on and kind of the moments you cherish. Um, favourite memories, favourite games. I think it would be playing some of the most memorable games would be the big schools playing against uh, Maryland. We almost beat them. Uh, you had a big game in that game. Game. The last, Yeah, the last like two, three minutes, they went 1-3-1 one, one zone and switched it up and messed us up completely. One of our guys had foul trouble, so we had a, a guard down kind of thing. Um, played against Michigan State. Uh, the coach the coach was, 
I don't know, legendary, man. They, 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 they beat us when they had Denzel Valentine and was in the NBA and stuff. Uh, who else? Um, with VCU, it was, it was the NCAA tournament, playing in the tournament. That was probably one of the best experiences. Just the size of the, the size of the court, the size of the arena we played in, the fans, um, the, uh, the teams, everything. It was, it was, it's just a something you just take in and just like you, you're overwhelmed in the moment. But looking back, it's like whoa, you got to really experience it. When it came to turning pro, uh, did you feel, you know, like at what point did you know that you had a shot at being a professional basketball player? Like, was it all the way through college, or kind of, you know, was it in your senior year as it as it started coming to a close? You started realizing, okay, it's time to hire an agent. This is actually going to happen now. Like, yeah, like at what point did it sort of click that you realized this this dream of being a professional basketball player is actually going to come to life? Um, it probably I probably realized it when I when I first actually got a contract. Before that, I didn't have really any idea of what the process was. I don't think there's a, a lot of people that have an idea of what the process actually is in terms of agents, in terms of um, what to do while you're in college, especially your junior and senior year. So I was just going for, with the ride and going with the flow kind of thing. I had agents from Facebook messaging me. I remember I signed with an agent, agent from Facebook when I first came out. You know, it's like a random person. You could have messaged me and been like, hey, I'm Sam Nett, I'm an agent. And I was like, cool, I've got an agent. Like just to say that was something exciting for me because I didn't know any better, you know. But I had meetings with my coaches and he talked about, uh, he talked with me about which agents to sign and he had conversations with them. I think I called Jackson, um, had a couple mentors talk talk to me about who the best direction would be. Um, but when it started, when my senior year finished, that's when I, I I knew, well going into my senior year, I knew that was the year that would determine the level of professional I would be, you know. What, what I mean is. That's that's uh, that's as, as much as I knew it as I'd be pro. Did you feel like you did it? You did NBA workouts, at, right? Or did you do NBA NBA summer league with Washington? One. Or I did one, uh, just a workout with the Wizards. I didn't do no no other summer league or workouts and stuff like that. Was that straight after your senior year? Yeah, that was after senior year. How was that? that, was, was, that as, how was, was that as an experience? Like, did you feel like like going into that? Did you feel like I have a legitimate shot at making the NBA if this workout goes well. Yeah, yeah I, I, I knew that if you gave me the opportunity, I'd perform. That's how, that's how my mindset is. Uh, I remember being there, uh, Alex Caruso was in the finals. He was in the workout. He was playing one-on-one and he was like going at it. So it was like, okay, I can, I can play with these, with these guys. I think um, Mason Plumley or Miles Plumley, one of them was in the workout. And even the experience for me was like something that was cool, I'd say, you know, it was like they, they called my agent was like, yeah, you're going to get a workout. And it was like from New Jersey to Washington was like a, it was like going from here to Manchester, like four hours. But they wanted to like fly me there and then, and then do this. And I was like, whoa, this is like, this is how we get treated or this is, this is crazy kind of thing. So the workout in itself was like an experience of, uh, was it was an experience. It was a, Obviously, going there and playing, I, I went in there with the mindset to really play and try and make a get a shot. I spoke to the GM, I spoke to the uh, coach, and uh, I don't know if it's not the owner, but after the president, after uh, we had like interviews after the workouts, where the, if they're interested, they'll talk to you about uh, where you come from and your story, kind of thing. So I did that stuff. I don't know. Hopefully, I'm still on their radar. We'll see what happens, man. <laughs> what what feedback did they give you in those in those interviews? Uh, they were kind of surprised because they had they didn't they didn't know who I was. I was coming from a small school, um, in a in a workout with with guys who were like had bigger names, and I was in there talking from the start from the warm up. I was just screaming random stuff like, oh, "Let's go! It's about to be a good day. About to be a good workout. Blah blah blah. Whatever." And they were like, "Who is this kid?" Then we did shooting competitions, and I was screaming random stuff like trash trash talking, but on like a respectable level not saying anything wild you know and then they were like this kid's got good energy this kid's uh where did he play before and then that was the year i think john wall was hurt so they were looking for a point guard the next year they ended up signing like trey burke or trey burke uh, um got traded there so i was like what is going on but it worked out for the for, for how it's meant to work out you know but it was a great experience so then 
when it came to the process of actually signing that that first contract, like what were the offers on the table in terms of like from the different teams? What different options were you looking at? Ultimately, you ended up signing in in Italy uh, with Pistoia, I think it was. It was um, kind of. That was the second. Huh? That was the second one. The first contract was in Estonia. Ah, uh, was it really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Go on, what break happened? it. Break it down for me. What What happened? What happened was I had a I had an agent. <laughs> Um, from Facebook, <laughs> you know, so I work with agents for Facebook. I don't really know what's going on and stuff. Um, I end up, he, he's end up taking long with all these deals because he's approaching big clubs. He's approaching like Valencia or, or, or Venice or, and they're like, who's this kid that didn't even go to like a big school and stuff like this, you know? So that was just, time was just dragging on. And I don't know anything about, uh, the professional life at that point, you know? So, uh, I ended up meeting another agent on Facebook again and he was like yeah, I'll get you a deal and I was just like yeah, I just want to play so whatever you can get me a deal I'll go sign with you kind of thing so I ended up signing with him he got me a deal in Estonia which was like a, a short term deal and it was like a, if you play if you if you get the right numbers you can leave kind of thing so uh, ended up going to Estonia for a month uh, for like two months and that and then left Estonia and went to Italy in like uh, December to November how is he? How easy is it to leave an arrangement, a contract with an like? Did you have you? You obviously well. Did you have a contract with the agent, and then you decide you want to sign with another agent? How easy is it to just be like, oh, actually, I'm going to go with this agent? Uh, at that at that point in time, I think I was just lucky because this agent uh, was trying to do as much as he could for me, but he wasn't really getting me anything that was uh, concrete or worth taking. So when I told him um, what was going on. He, he didn't kind of mind. He let me, he just was like, okay, cool. I'm not going to stop you, especially being your first year. I'm not going to stop you from your, your dream, your goal or, and it's right in front of you, you know? So he just, he just kind of like, uh, I don't know what you call it, released me and then let me sign with the other agent. Um, in terms of the deal with the team, that was like a, it was meant to be like a longer term thing, but, uh, and they had a low budget. When I went there, it was like I just wanted to play. So I would say I've, I tweeted this earlier. It was like it was for seven hundred euros for the first for the first month. It, well, that was the that was the contract period. It's going to be seven hundred euros every month. And then um, the first six weeks I was there, I played really good. Whatever. Uh, Facebook comes up again. An Italian agent messaging me like, "Yo, <laughs> we could get you this job here for this much." And I'm like, "Okay, we gotta go." Talk to my coach. He was like. He wasn't happy about it at first. And then he was like, uh, from the same perspective, like, it's your career. I understand um, uh, what's going on and I understand the opportunity you have. I'm not going to hold you back. It just sucks that it impacted that team at that time. But he was, I was just, I was just fortunate enough where they let me uh, progress pretty much. Yeah, yeah. How do you find the pro life? Uh, I like it. I like the freedom of the pro life. I like how much... Uh, you get to, to do other things and experience other culture, like the traveling. Uh, the only, the, one of the biggest downfalls for me is uh, being away from family, being away from home. It's like, a, and missing holidays, that's the, the biggest thing. You miss birthdays, Christmas, New Year's, um, I don't know, whatever, any holiday you miss. So that kind of sucks. Apart from that, it's pretty good. Making the transition from, from college to being a professional, like what would you say were the biggest changes like of course uh, well i assume part of it is that you all of a sudden don't have to go to class anymore uh, and you just live in the life yeah. like kind of yeah what were the what were the biggest uh, switches uh first is like the food you have to learn to cook you have to learn to do stuff for your for yourself you know before you're like you can go to a cafeteria you can go to a canteen do whatever you want you got unlimited swipes you got a coach telling you what time to be at practice telling you to come rebound or do extra work or you've got everything scheduled for you and then when you become a pro everything is based on you if you wake up late you're fine if you wake up if you if you miss food you know like you just ain't got the energy for practice you might end up like uh performing bad end up getting cut in the long term you know these things add up over time so uh the transition was just being alone, that much alone, because I believe in at 17, you're kind of already alone trying to find your way. And then the pro life was just adding extra things where I would have to build myself again in terms of cooking, in terms of time management, in terms of doing laundry, little things to grow up, grow up, you know, uh, and then and then find interests that keep you uh, busy and, and productive outside of basketball because you play basketball maybe two hours in the morning, maybe you straight, uh, lift and work out and then at night you're at practice two hours. So what do you do in that meantime? You know, what, what, that's, that was the biggest, 
thing for me. But being from Europe, being from London or England, so uh, you get friends that it's easier to travel. Where, the, where whereas coming from America, it's harder. So my friends' flights would be cheaper, and they'd come out for like a week. My first year in Pistoia, my grandma came and stayed with me for like three months because I just I was like, this doesn't make sense. I don't have nothing else to do. We might as well come and <laughs> hang out in a different country. So that's what I do with all my friends. I just tell them to come out for like a week, two weeks, and that's how I keep it. The the time busy or productive when your when your friends family aren't aren't visiting you what do you do with the downtime uh for them most of the time it's a vacation or a holiday for me it's not you know i still have to practice and all this stuff so in the meantime i might it's 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 like them experiencing the culture that i'm experiencing while i'm living there you know so we'll just go out to places to eat or it's a new country like i played in italy greece um those are the main countries actually but my friends have both come to both countries so they they almost say oh you need to go back to this country next year you need to do it and like, all right we'll see kind of thing but that's that's the that's what we do just experience the culture talk to as many people as we can uh eat as much of that food as we can or just to embrace the culture that we're we're in when you left estonia to go to italy did you find uh it was a big step up uh on the court like basketball wise yeah, yeah, yeah. They were they were way more intense again. They were more about uh, not the not the they were w- about winning. They were being about results. You know, it's like if you win, it's good. If you lose, somebody's gonna get cut after a couple games, pretty much. You know, that's how that's how the business goes. They they're not into because it's it's about money now. You know, you're losing somebody money, so uh, that is very cutthroat. And so when I got there, we won the first game. And I remember not even I think I had I remember actually I had seven points and like three assists the first game the first weekend. And one, my big man came up to me. He was like, "Yo, bro, you did really good, man. You're gonna stay. That's good, man. We won." And I was like, "What do you mean? Like, uh, were we not meant to win? Like, we're at home. What's going on? You know?" And he was like, "I know, but still, man." And I was like, "Okay, cool." But the step up was like from Estonia's league. It's Italy's considered one of the, the best top five in Europe, anyway. So the league was a uh, competitive. It was fun. But when we got there, our coach won coach of the year. We made the playoffs. Um, it was good. It was fun. One, that was probably maybe my one of my favorite teams. One of my favorite, yeah. What 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 were your uh, like? You kind of ended up. Well, in fact, actually, before we do that, <laughs> you 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 touched upon it there. Everyone seems to have some crazy stories from from Europe. Whether it's you know coaches going absolutely nuts, you know people mm-hmm. getting sacked for bad performances, pay being yeah. withheld. Like, what's your craziest story that you've seen? Uh, in your time uh, playing in on the continent, hmm. I don't know. I've had I've had the crazy coaches to me is more funny because I've always relate as a point guard. You always relate to your coaches kind of different. Like they trust you like a lot because you're like their extension on the floor, you know. So they don't really get mad so much at me in terms of what I'm doing. It's just watching how mad they get is kind of like you know like this guy is really crazy, you know. Uh, the coach Pozeko, which is he was the coach uh, Sassari when they won the Euro Cup, I think he was one of my co- he was one of my coaches when I moved to Italy from uh, Greece halfway through the season, and he was like a everybody says he's crazy, but he's like a crazy and a passionate good kind of crazy way. Like if you're messing up, he's like he just wants to do good so much that you know like it comes out a little bit crazy. But uh, the delayed payments that that stuff is really crazy to me. I never understand that because we see the same. I say this all the time. We see the same people walk in the gym, you know, and they'll walk right by you and be like, yo, what, what's going on, you know? So that stuff, that's, that in itself, it's crazy, but I haven't really got no crazy story stories like anything wild that's happened. Have but, you have you uh, got money that's still owed to you by any teams previous? You don't need to name the teams or, or have you been paid uh, every paycheck? I've, I've been, I've, I've got everything I'm owed right now, up to date, yeah, I'm good. Okay, I'm good. I've good. chased teams i've chased a couple of teams i've stayed in greece a little longer than i should have just to wait for teams i've done i've done stupid stuff like i don't know keep the rental car for a little bit an extra month or something <laughs> so, so dumb stuff but it's all worked this way out way out and i've got a great relationship with all the, the people in the offices so that's what you got to do you got to make sure you have those good relationships with the accountant gms coaches and do your job obviously you know yeah but then after that everything will work out i was going to say you, you you know when you talk about relationships and stuff like it was almost like you you've carved out yourself a nice a nice little uh spot in Greece where where you know you've played three three seasons there now of your of your how many years you've been pro you turned pro in 2016 so what's four yeah four, four. years 
with my fourth one finished. Um, yeah. So, like, what is it about Greece you think that that kind of like that's kept you going back there? Um, yeah. So after after Pistoia, the coach at Kimi uh, kind of was like, okay, you're gonna come here and play and start, and that was my first opportunity, like break to 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 show the professional world I could play. You know, when you start, it's different from coming off the bench. Uh, as a as a as a young player, you know, it's like a it's like a, a privilege kind of thing, and so that was the big choice in going there at the start, and then this, and then I, I left halfway through that year to go to Bologna for like playoffs, um, and then I came back to Greece because I was comfortable with the league. The league was different; it was more, uh, it's not as as much up and down, but it's very much five on five, and it's like chess kind of thing. You have to slow down, and there's a lot of pick and roll, there's a lot of post ups, there's a lot of slow down game and to re, you have to really know the game and that's what I liked about it and then the third year last year my f- coach from the first year in Greece was the coach so it was like easy to just play yeah. with him again you know I already knew his system he knew how I played and that that's what it was that's why I went back there so we always hear crazy stories about the fans in Greece uh you know what, what would you say about the the sort of the atmosphere atmospheres that, that you you've played in uh the, the fans are great, man. The fans are passionate. That's what I call them. They're just passionate. They come across crazy, but they just they want their team to win, and they're so behind their team. It's 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 kind of crazy because they'll see you on the road, or they'll see you on the street, going shops, and they're like, "Hey, we go win this team. We go beat this team." Blah, blah blah. Why is this guy playing bad? Why is this guy playing good? Oh, you play good. Or they'll tell you straight, like, oh, "You you played really bad, man. You lost us that game." Or they'll DM you crazy stuff. So it's just it's part of the game, man. It? It's just. Yeah. Something you get used to, but it throws you off at first. But the fans there, the atmosphere and the, the passion they have for the game as a, as a country is, is incredible. It's inspiring for us, I think, because when you see, like, especially Panathinaikos or Olympiakos rivalry, and you see them shooting off firecrackers or smoke and in the stadium while the game's going on, it's, it's nuts. It's crazy. Have the, has a fan ever taken it too far with you in terms of talk, telling you about your own performance or, you know, getting too close or whatever it might be? Uh, I'm sure they have, but I just, I just, I just don't react to it. It doesn't really matter because once the game's done, the game's done. I can't check, go back and change it. Yeah. It's, it's I only try and improve the next game. And I don't play for that one fan. I play for me first, the team, and then everybody else, as, as a, as a collective. After that, you know, as much as you want to do the fans, but once it gets to a point where you're telling me about my life, I'm not interested in hearing it. <laughs> why, why do you think, um, like British people? when it comes to watching basketball are so reserved and we don't have that same crazy like, I'm always just like oh when I when I think about it I'm always like oh it's because in the UK uh you know we're we're as a culture we're more reserved as people do you know what I mean but then I but then I I think about football games and just the absolute hooliganism <laughs> that we see and the craziness we see I'm like well actually clearly it's yeah. not the case but but why is that why does that not translate to basketball like why is it like I don't it's very rare I can even think of being at any type of British basketball game where it feels like the crowd is really into it, you know? Um, interesting. Uh, maybe it's got something to do with being judged. I don't know. Maybe they don't want to jump out there because it's hard right now if you go from a place where it doesn't happen to how's it going to happen. Somebody's got to do the first firecracker or somebody's got to come in there going crazy you know and it's like who's that going to be and then how's he going to be looked at and who's going to follow and is somebody going to follow and maybe that maybe that's the approach but when you're when you're in certain environments when you go play hoop uh, hoops pro classics those environments are lit those environments everybody's standing up and jumping around midnight madness there was it was it was crazy um I remember that when we had the dunk contest and everybody was jumping around with the tens and everything else. So we, it's it's possible. It's, it happens. It just needs to happen on a bigger stage where people that don't. It happens within the basketball community. I'd say it doesn't happen so much with the fans outside of it. You know the ones that uh, are, you know what I'm saying. So the ones that play and they come watch somebody else's game get hyped. But I don't I don't really see random people just come in there and just get hyped. I don't I don't know why. I don't know what we're gonna do to change it. But yeah, so it's, hopefully. Uh... It's a it's a weird one. Have you what's the uh what's the best crowd you, you've played in front of with G B? With G B Eurobasket in Turkey against Turkey. Nuts. Yeah. <laughs> that was that, 
That's I did. You see flags, flags everywhere because they're passionate about their team. And I think we played in the Fenerbahce Stadium, so it was it was full. I think it's like maybe 50, 20,000 people there going crazy. And we, it was a Sedi Usman just was about to go to the NBA with Cleveland, so they were all behind him. And the game was close. I think we might have lost the game by maybe like five, six, seven points, something like that. So at first, not at first, uh, even towards the end, it was like, which way is it going to go? And the crowd is nuts in Turkey. When you talk about uh, standout memories with the GB national team that you've had so far, um, mm. what are the ones that, that come to mind first? Um... One of them would be playing in, in Poland when we played, I think we played Poland and we played Israel and Israel kept beating us. We played in like a couple games the, in, during that summer campaign in the lead up for Eurobasket and they would beat us, beat us. But they were doing the same thing and we just wasn't, it, the switch wasn't flicking or clicking or whatever. And then it clicked one time and we came out and we just, was, we played perfect. Everybody played like as best as we could and we won and it was like, that's how we're meant to play moving forward. And we we managed to do that a couple of times. Sometimes we haven't, but that's that's one of the the highlights. And then just the traveling and stuff, the places we get to see and the places we can go. Israel, amazing. Uh, well, Turkey, Eurobasket was an experience because we was there for two weeks. Where the, they've got a hotel with like five different nations in the hotel. You get to see people, watch games all the time. So those are probably the best memories. How are you feeling about the current GB group? Uh, I like them. Uh, I've always said that's probably my favourite team to play for because um, it's the same core guys or it's the same guys. It's the, it's the one team in the summer. Like everybody plays pro and then they finish their season and then the next year they don't know where they're going. So they don't know who their teammates are going to be. But you know when you come to GB it's going to be, you know, you don't know for sure, but the same group of guys is going to be probably me, Ovi, Miles, uh, Ashley Hammer and Gabe, Justin, uh, Ogo will be in there, Luke Nelson will be in there, Gabe, uh, I say Gabe, all these guys will be in, Andrew will be in there. So it's, it's, you get, it's fun, first of all, because they're your friends and they're the same people you grow up with. And it's the, the, the team that you've had the longest, I, I put it like that. So that's, uh, for me, that's the, my favourite team to play for. The upcoming windows in November, is it? yeah, it's November. Are you planning on suiting up? Yeah, I'm always ready to suit up. Perfect. Yeah. What do you have you have you seen the obviously the FIBA announcement that the the, the games are going to move to bubble so you potentially lose that home double header uh, and are going to be playing in a neutral central venue somewhere somewhere in Europe. Uh, obviously that's a that's a big I think that's a big bummer for the fans for sure. Um, yeah. But kind of how do you feel about it as a as a team? Like do you think it will potentially impact your performances compared to if you were able to have the the two games at home? Yeah, uh, I think when we played at Newcastle, that was great because the fans helped us win that game. Like, literally, it was, it was down to the wire until it broke out with Ben Mock pushing some crazy shots, you know? So I think moving forward and going into a bubble, it's going to be a completely different environment because it's like almost uh, what the NBA is doing now, where you're going to have no fans, so you're going to just be able to hear yourself and your team. So everybody's going to be, I don't know, it's, it's, it's going to be a shock. But then again, it's for everybody. Everybody's going to have to experience it. It's not just us so they're going to be the same and when it's on that playing field i don't because when we played um who is it is it it's not massive. montenegro no was it montenegro yeah montenegro they their fans were just as crazy so it was it was tough to play but when you take away the fans completely and it's a neutral site i think it, it, it's it's fair it's, it's something it's a challenge but it's just gonna be the best team that wins how confident are you of qualifying for for eurobasket I'm confident. Uh, I don't go into games thinking we're going to lose. I don't. That's not. That's never been my mindset. So every game I think we could be played is, is tough. It's something you have to work for. It's not something you just go in there and say I'm going to win. Especially when you don't get the respect from other nations that you think you should get. So that's even a more chip on your shoulder or underdog mentality to come in there and play and 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 try to like stick it to them, not just beat them, but be like you know, we're we're here. We're not. I don't know what you keep disrespecting us for not giving us our credit but we've got hoopers that can hoop so prove it and play and I'm, I'm, I'm confident I'm fine On your journey in the pros have you ever had uh, players on opposing teams you know when they're like talking smack to you or whatever say do they make comments about the fact that you're from England Yeah yeah, yeah they do that but for, for jokes for banner they're like oh, like, I might wear my GBT shirt and they'll be like oh they got basketball in England and you're like ha 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 
you know, but then we would, go, we would play, we'd just be trash talking back or I'll say something about their culture back, you know, I'd say, maybe I might say you can't see us in football or something, you know, just something that can then whatever, you know, but yeah. Perfect. Right, let's do some uh, quick, quick fire questions just to, just to wrap up. Um, okay. Starting with uh, your favourite basketball memory so far. Favourite basketball memory so far. Um, CAA tournament, playing against uh, George Mason and winning the tournament. We got rings after that. We got to cut down the nets. No, no better feeling than finishing the season with a W. Best player you've ever played against? Best player, Jimmy Butler. You can actually tell that story. <laughs> oh, this, this is just a, this is just Westfield. He came, he came to a couple box last year. He comes in the summertime isn't it, and plays pickup. So watching him play pickup and then come with his guys, that's, and he's on, he's in the finals right now. I'm going with the Heat, even in the up soon. So. I'm going to go with Jimmy. Sick. Uh, the best British player that you've played against or played with? Are we counting Ben Gordon? Mm, no. Okay. Um, best British player. Oh, this is tough. The guards or, big, or just only guards? Just, just, it's up to you. Uh, best British player. Mm. No, it's probably it's, it might have to be. I don't I don't know the best British player, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I can't, uh, it's tough. They're all tough in the same. Uh, I like I like going against Andrew. I like going against Justin, and I like going against Tariq Phillips. Nice. Those are the three guys I like going against. Your favourite GB teammate? Uh, either Dan Clark or Ben Mockford, man. We're, the, we're always together. That trio is always together doing wild stuff, man. Uh, best coach you've ever played for? Best coach? Uh, Probably Joe Prime. Probably Joe Prime. And then uh, rewinding back, so... Or Nate Rankin. Nate Rankin, I know he's a <laughs> coach. I'm not saying that. that. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, rewinding, rewinding back, um, the best British junior player. So they didn't have to do anything at a professional level, but mm-hmm. as an under-18, uh, is there anyone that sticks out in your mind as the, as the best uh, British junior player that you've ever seen? Uh, you know who was really crazy? Kalen. Kalen Raftopoulos. He was, he was, he could shoot from half court when, when we was coming up. Still now he could shoot. And then, uh, what do you want to achieve in the next, let's say, let's say before your career's up, next five years, kind of, if I was to sit down with you in five years time and we're looking back on, on, on your, on your career, uh, what do you want to have, have achieved in that time? Uh, I think the goal is still EuroLeague. I think to, to get to EuroLeague, um, to win a championship in, in, in A League and Euro League, obviously, if you if you can, uh, you have to set your goals kind of wild. So Euro League, perfect. That's, that's a perfect place to leave it. Um, yeah. Well, Teddy, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure, despite the uh, internet problems. But uh, <laughs> we got we got there in the end, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing where you sign this year. Uh, I hope that it will be closer to me than than usual. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we'll see, we'll see how it all plays out. But yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll see you very soon. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.